aggregate all the chains of making it thus far. Um, in OG, we have seen but not responded. In OO, we have 711 workers. In CG, we have Big Mac and Dorbiki. In CO, we have no EA. Okay, uh, on the motion that in cases where in the in cases where it's proven that a majority of the town is proven to harbor insurgents, this also not as well war crimes and civilians, civilians, elected by the Prime Minister here, here. Mr. Speakers, war has changed. War is fought among streets. War is fought in towns. War is no longer fought in a battlefield. War is sometimes fought against women and children holding grenades that you never knew would be there. War is fought deliberately, deliberating the moral righteousness of our cause and the, necess and the necessary means we must go to fight them. Why do we believe that today's motion is a necessary motion in the scheme of things, in how we fight wars, and how we conduct, and as soldiers conduct themselves within wars. Couple definitions in this debate. Firstly, what do we think like insurgents are, and therefore the context of this debate is? We don't think the context of this debate is like full out war between two nations, and like we should go into like cities because they're like entirely harboring um, soldiers. We think like even in that context, it's morally about like things like guerrilla warfare. It's like things like terrorists. It's like things where cities are known to be harboring these people. What do we mean by harbor, Mr. Speaker? We don't think harbor means like they're just in there or like they're like sometimes going there to buy food. But that harbor, def like dictionary definition wise, means actively keeping, that they're sheltering, that they allow them to be here. Like the majority of the town is okay with the idea of these terrorists being in the town and they're willing to support them to a certain level. Like what do we think um, the kind of harms come from this? We think if there's definite evidence that people are cooperating and that therefore they are sheltering or harboring uh, terrorists and extremists, Couple things happen. Firstly, they provide support to these people. Like support just as in form of shelter. Like even if they don't give weapons or money, the very fact that they have a town to use as a shield, that they can run and hide and, uh, and, and therefore minimize or mitigate the ability of foreign army or like of armies to try to wipe them out is in itself very detrimental to the war effort and the kind of cause we're trying to fight for. But secondly, this also can show in the form of how like a lot of the soldiers are drawn from the ranks of those towns. Like because they're supporting those troops, when they ask for like more insurgents to join their cause, many people do join their cause in the future. And this eventually leads to a prolonging of conflict, but an escalation of conflict. Like if Upbench comes up with the idea that we should never really invade a town that has civilians in it, that means the war can never be fought and the war therefore will never end. We'll tell you why that's problematic in our arguments. What do we mean by shoot civilians, Mr. Speaker? We're not talking about let's go and exterminate villages by dropping nukes on all towns that have insurgents. We do want to minimize the kind of casualties that there will be. But what the motion calls for Gov Bench to prove to us, that OG to prove to us, that the extra casualties in fighting the wars among the streets, among civilians, among people who are disguised as, so disguised as civilians, who are actually soldiers, we'll talk about this later. In these kind of conditions, that we do have a mandate when fighting these wars to allow, um, to, to treat these casualties as outside of the definition of a war crime, Mr. Speaker. So the worst case we'll be asked to defend is what about the case where we do shoot civilians who didn't want the insurgents in their town? What about the case where we do shoot people who are presumed innocent? We'll tell you why collectively there is a responsibility and collectively there is some blame and therefore this action is justified. But we'd like to point out that it's not Gov's burden to prove to us that we enjoy these casualties of war, that we enjoy the discriminate, indiscriminate killings, if there is, of women and children. But to point out to you that these are casualties of war that we are unwilling to let low, that we are unwilling to not fight, that we will direct engage in and accept. We will prove to you two things in this debate. Firstly, prove that this is a fight needed, and secondly, this is a fight that is therefore justified. Sir. Fine. If your pure goal is to end the war as fast as possible, are you willing to kill civilians who are a hostage of these terrorists? 
Okay, we think that this is like, an in, uh, like a different context. Like, like, it's not the same thing. Like in the context where that is like, where the, like, where the town has hostages perhaps, maybe in that case, like it could happen. But we think the more moral like thing we're trying to say is that like making the moral calculations of whether if a town is harboring these like insurgents or like harboring these uh, terrorists, whether it's okay for us to go into cities. Like if you want us to defend that, I think that's still, if it is in line with the principle, then sure. But okay, let's go into my own arguments to tell you what kind of principles we stand for. Why do we think this isn't necessarily a war crime under our side of the house? Firstly, what does it, like, what does it mean to actively harbor? We think, we think opposition bench does not take this debate if they tell us that some of these civilians are hostages or some of these civilians are like not really like wanting to be part of this effort. Because we think when we say a majority of the town is harboring civilians, are harboring terrorists, we think this is also a form of collective decision. The same way we do give collective responsibility to, um, to, the, pe uh, to the people in Germany during Hitler's regime, where even if they weren't part, actively part of the war effort, the very fact that they refused to stand against the ideals or they refused to stand against the terrible things that were happening also gives them a collective duty. Why is this? We don't think these insurgents are just like political prisoners who are trying to hide out in a town. There are people who actively go out and massacre and murder civilians. These terrorists are people who go into other towns and cities to kill children and to kill women. Who are like, they're not just fighting a war against soldiers, but fighting a war against other civilians in um, the nation as well. They're the ones who are disrupting the order of the nation, therefore bringing pain and the war to these cities. Therefore, we think when they're collectively harboring them, we think there's a, we think there's like, um, a sense of guilt it's given to them as well because they are allowing these actions to continue. We'd like to also point out that what a war crime by definition is, is like an indiscriminate killing. Things like biological weapons or chemical weapons. Like the reasons why soldiers wear uniforms is to identify themselves. Like to identify these are the soldiers, these are the people who are fighting. Insurgents deny that principle. They wear clothes to look like civilians. Their entire fighting principle is based around hiding among civilians and then using the towels as shields to protect themselves. Here's why this is very pro problematic, Mr. Speaker and why we do not think, therefore, this is indiscriminate um, conf uh, killing. This is therefore, like these people are actively part of the conflict, they're actively harboring these people and therefore they're actively aiding the conflict, but they're also like part of a situation where it's impossible for us to identify who the real fight is, and therefore these fight fights, if must be fought, has to be fought in this way. But why do we think, therefore, these are fights that has to be fought? Firstly, we think that in these kind of fights, there's no end in sight. There's a reason why we don't see an end to terrorism or these Islamic conflicts in the Middle East. It's because these, um, it's because these terrorists find it very easy to use these towns as shields or to go back into these towns, gather support, gather safety, and then come out and attack again, to use these towns as bases. If we follow the logic that we should never invade a town that has like civilians in it or like majority of civilians are happy with this, then we also find a war where we're unable to ever end the conflict. And while that conflict is going on, those indiscriminate um, killings by those terrorists continue forever, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. At the end of the day, what we believe on OG is that if there is a war that we need to fight in a certain way, that the, and that we do show that a majority of civilians are in some way in like conflict or in some ways part of the conflict, we think this is an action that is necessary, an action therefore we are willing to take. Thank you. Thanks for your speech. Not that good, but you know, we're on the same page here. this debate that has never been touched upon in the previous speech is the fact that these states can just define these insurgents and the ethnic groups that are rebelling against them apparently and to just indiscriminately kill the individuals who are considered minorities in particular states right so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to directly contest the characterization coming from them and say that states have disproportionate amounts of power that we think international norms and international community has an exceptional obligation to be able to deter in the status quo but the other thing is this, right? 
we don't actually think that there is no other option in terms of actually taking out things in guerrilla warfare, right? We're talking about cooperating with local groups like the Kurdish Peshmerga in, 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 in like fights against ISIS. We're also talking about things like going into these groups and just not just not making it uh, just making it a war crime to severely condemn the extra cases in which there were no other options but for the, there to be some civilian casualties, right? So we don't actually think that that side of the house proves their burden by saying that sometimes it is necessary to kill civilians. They must defend a world in which there are no international norms that actually pre prevent like these states from being incentivized to actually not carry out war crimes in these areas. Most of my uh, like I'm going to respond to a lot of their material in my argumentation, but let's point out a, a couple of things that come from the, the Prime Minister. The first thing is that we think that the first, uh, the, the first thing is that we think that they largely concede a part of like the, the the principle in this debate when they talk about collective responsibility, right? Because they concede that certain civilians do not wish to participate in this conflict. Certain civilians are minorities in this, these towns who maybe do not want to support the particular insurgent in place, right? So we don't actually think that the majoritarian gener generalization that says that certain parts of these towns actively take part in, in like helping these insurgents actually gives them grounds to say that the rest of the town is responsible for those individuals and those things, right? But the second thing is this, right? There is a difference even in that case between supporting insurgents and being decided, deciding to partake in that conflict and be part of that group, right? And we think that there is a distinction between civilians and insurgents and that, defi that, that def definition is important in terms of preserving international norms, right? Sorry. No, thank you. No, thank you. They say that, furthermore, that it is easy to use these towns as shields and that this is common activity on part of these like insurgent groups, right? We say that there are effective strategies that are being used in the status quo to effectively combat like organizations like ISIS and, and uh, uh, organizations like ISIS in the, the Middle East, for example, and that given that, that these effective strategies exist, they haven't actually proven to you that there are no other alternatives or things like that. But let's firstly talk about what constitutes a war crime, right? Because we think that the characterization of what war crimes are from OGU was disingenuous. We think that the reason why international nor norms exist is because for parties engaging in a conflict, we want to ensure that we uh, we minimize the level of destruction that exists, to minimize the kind of the, the kind of destruction that exists to like not people who aren't participating in this war, right? So the first thing, no thank you, we're going to say is that there is a difference, right, between civilians and insurgents, and that, sure, you can you can name insurgents like dangerous rebels or things like that, but we think that most of this, these civilians are trying to live their day, daily lives, and it is deeply contradictory for their, their side of the house to go against international norms and just indiscriminately kill them. The second thing we're going to say is that this gives di disproportionate power to governments to name minorities enemies of Sorry. the state, and we think that governments have an overwhelming ability to do that, right? We're talking about the Assad government, spray staring gas on particular towns that house rebels. We're talking about the military government in Myanmar continually oppressing particular Rohingya Muslims, like, like naming ethnic minorities just enemies of the state because there happen to be insurgents because of the bad conditions that exist, right? The third thing we're going to note is that insurgencies in themselves should not be defined as completely illegitimate or completely bad, right? So we think that in certain cases there are legitimate concerns that are being carried out by these like particular insurgents because they're, I'll take you in a moment, because we think that there, in this particular case there is a problem Problem in case, a, a pro problem with these governments because of things like deep antipathies between like different ethnic groups within these states and things like that. Go ahead. We agree that if governments fake evidence to actively kill civilians, that is a war crime. What about in justified situations where you do know that civilians are actively harboring um, insurgents, would you also not fight those wars? Right. So we still think that you haven't proven to, proven to us that. Like the, it, it is the same thing to participate in this com conflict and to actively harbor civilians, right? actively harbor insurgents, right? We still think that there's a difference there, right? In terms of just you as an individual just participating in the conflict by drawing up arms and like maybe like sh shooting at the police, and there's a difference between that and be being being a civilian, maybe like maybe like the insurgent group is next to you. We don't think that that actually is grounds for you to carry out like killings against them. The final thing to note here, though, is that we think that. Like war crimes about uh, like the definition of war crimes and the way that we legislate them speaks to the kind of international norms that exist within the international society, right? Yeah. So even if it is the case that on our side of the house we can sometimes defend in no like cases where there are absolutely no alternatives, like the killing of certain casualties, we think that there is a difference between that and on their side of the house where they just cla don't classify this as a war crime and therefore there are just no accountability mechanisms to effectively ensure right that these things are considered as serious problems by the international. National community at large. No. Let's talk about how this worsens conflict because 
recognize that most of their cases, like about utilitarian outcomes, we think that they actually lose on this ground as well. The first is concerning like the hostage situations that they wanted to just avoid in this debate. We think that this is probably a fantastic way for ISIS to win the propaganda war in the status quo, right? We think that when, when you kill civilians who actively protest the war or actively are against the war, right, ISIS can just say, these are Western nations that are coming into these areas, right? You can generate propaganda against the groups that exist within these areas. Yeah, yeah. The second thing we're going to say is, um, no, we think that these groups uh, and these areas in the characterization of their side are deeply suspicious of things like Western intervention or things like the state being, uh, like the state, state military being in these areas. What you do on your side of the house is because these civilians have no option because there is certain death because it is not a war crime for these states to just kill civilians, right? These civilians have no other option then or feel that there is no option but to join the military, right? So we think that what happens is you empower these groups within these areas and even if this city is something that you're able to take, that is a st strategic loss for your side because the rest of the region is going to rise up under your side of the house, is going to rebel against your government. But the final thing we want to, uh, the third thing we want to point out is about like infrastructural harms and the long-term re reparations after the war. We think that when you have this and when you have like larger amounts of damage against these civilian populations, it is harder to repair things after the war. But the final thing is like the massive cases of abuse that exist and the like the la less uh, like, like the minimized accountability mechanisms under their side of house. So prefacing back to the ideas about international norms, we think that even if it is the case that in certain cases we might be able to justify certain civilians dying, we still think that it is important that these international norms exist. We find their case morally abhorrent. We have hope. Can we order? Mr. Speaker, it's incredibly frustrating coming as a DPM, not being able to move the debate forward, but correct the leader of opposition on multiple wrong things that he has committed in this debate. First of all, he tells us there's a distinct differentiation between civilians and the insurgents. Not exactly sure what the, what the distinction is, because he hasn't actually told us, he just told us twice, literally, that there is a distinction, but hasn't exactly elaborated as what, it is, what that is. Secondly, he tells us there's an alternative. I was really eager to hear it so I can engage with it, but he hasn't told me one yet, right? So we'll leave that to the deputy leader uh, DLO and then we'll deal with that when that comes, right? Second of all, he, when they talk about the idea of states can just randomly label, randomly label any rebel group as insurgents and therefore indiscriminately kill them, we think that's actually false characterization. Why? Because we already do have other international organizations such as, peace, uh, such as other part, distinct, part of, distinct part of UN that actually investigates these kinds of atrocities and solve it, right? Because even if under their case they're right that the government is actively killing people as by, by, by labeling them as insurgents and whatnot, we think that even under, under that characterization, under that context, government already doesn't give a shit about killing civilians anyway, Mr. Speaker, right? So there's absolutely no benefit that they're providing to you that we did not have. Secondly, when they tell us essentially that these people are just like not agreeing with it, just kind of living there, they don't agree with it, couple of things. When they basically said majority of the town is harboring, right? Essentially, they are the majority of the town is consented to giving them shelter and safety and so on and so forth. We think that that is a sort to a certain degree an act of consent. Just because you didn't vote for a war doesn't mean you're not at war, Mr. Speaker. And second of all, we already told you as a town, as a collective entity between sit down, as a collective entity that has shared responsibility to the uh, that has a shared responsibility as in kind of like a uh, what's that contract? Um, civil contract. Essentially, you so to even if you're a minority that don't agree in taking part in the conflict you still do share a certain level of responsibility because you are a part of the town, Mr. Speaker. Then they, sec, sit down. Secondly, secondly, when they basically tell us that you know utilitarian calculus, like people getting people getting um, 
like people getting like roused into a conflict. We think that that's also a false characterization as well. Why? Because we already see things like bombing, essentially that that causes extensive damage to property, as well as high probability of civilians being involved in it. They have absolutely no qualms about those kind of things, Mr. Speaker. So their burden in this debate today is essentially to tell us why any method that's not exact precise in terms precise in terms of identifying and killing insurgents is an unjustified burden on them. So essentially, let me re recharacterize a couple of things so we can move forward in this debate, right? When we talk about war crime, it's not just any kind of atrocity, the vague idea that they describe. It's essentially indiscriminate killing that defy, de uh, that defy human rights and so on and so forth. This is why we don't allow rape, uh, this is why we don't allow psychological warfare such as rape of civilians. This is why we don't allow indiscriminate killing, ma uh, weapons of mass destruction, so on and so forth. And we're going to tell you, because they basically characterize our side as saying, we're going to go into towns and indiscriminately kill. No, what, what the Prime Minister told us, when, they, when, they, when the motion basically stated that shoot civilians, right? Not kill or exterminate civilians or destroy the town. What we mean is that we are going to allow them to engage in conflict. Reason being, under status quo, if this is a considered war crime, what happens is that these soldiers who are trying to, trying to end the conflict as soon as possible by identifying and, identifying and capturing or eliminating these insurgents that are hiding out in these, in these uh, hiding out among civilian population, essentially cannot engage in conflict that, that are, that cannot engage in conflict even when the civilians are around because of this kind of restriction. We think that allowing them to engage and therefore overtake the town, and yes, we are going to push for minimum casualty as possible, but under their side, they, they basically says no casualty should occur, whereas we're on our side, we're willing to take some level of casualty as we told you with collective responsibility, right? Because we're going to tell you on my, second, on, my, on, my, on my other parts of speech as to why that's actually better on our side. But furthermore, when they talk about in terms of what if they're a hostage situation, we think that's even better on our side. Why? Because when ISIS takes a village hostage, it's not a very great place to be there, Mr. Speaker. What happens in these places is basically things, atrocities such as cannibalism, atrocities such as slavery, uh, rape of children. These things all happen under captured ISIS villages. We think that even with some casualty, when soldiers from US or UN forces can liberate those villages, we think that's actually better. And allowing them to shoot and engage in conflict in those villages, in those settings, actually allow us to end the conflict better, save these people from atrocities that they're basically, that, that the government's uh, opposition side is dooming and tap. Yes, what is it? Can you please characterize this collective responsibility that civilians somehow magically have by being part of the town? Essentially, when we basically tell the majority of town is harboring, right? It didn't say, it didn't say the insurgents are simply there. Harboring is an active verb. It's, uh, with the English accent, I expect you to know a little bit better about it. <laughs> but essentially, it means an active verb. Is these people have made active decisions to do that. We think that when the, when the more than half of the United States didn't want Trump, but Trump was elected anyway, that doesn't, just because, that, just because there were some part, large minority, although, large minority didn't agree with Trump, that, that, that doesn't delegitimize that decision, Mr. Speaker. So collective responsibility, we already have that. So going on a little bit further, what's, why this shouldn't be a war crime? First, we talk about a soldier psychology because, because when these insurgents hide out in villages, it becomes an extremely stressful situation that these soldiers are placed under extreme duress. Why? Because they don't know who's the enemy. Under, under, under traditional warfare, the people wear uniforms, so you know that they're part of conflict, that they're mutual consent, that we can shoot each other, right? Under, under, under current status quo, though, that doesn't happen. These people don't identify themselves as enemy soldiers. They hide out as innocent civilians so they can shoot these people on back. So when these soldiers were placed under long duration in terms of during operation it's placed on the extreme stress as to being by being able to attack from uh, being uh, by a possibility of being attacked from any side anywhere we think that these soldiers are already in the, under extreme duress too so we think that any level of atrocities that, that occur under duress has to be mitigated to a certain degree that's what the side government aside government believes but furthermore when we talk about in terms of deterrence as well mr. speaker because we because at the end I think the goal of this debate today is to end the conflict as soon as possible and limit the civilian casualty as much as possible, Mr. Yeah, Speaker, yeah. right? So we think that that actually creates a necessity. Why? So we have to ask questions. Why do these insurgents hide out in villages? Why do these insurgents hide out in cities? Because that's not exactly a very strategic location, Mr. Speaker. With multiple entryways, with, with, wide, open, with wide open spaces, they're not militarily strategic positions to hide or make a base, right? So why do they hide? Because they're essentially, they know that under current norm, under current norm where opposition side is maintaining, these soldiers cannot engage 
engage in those conf engage conflict in these areas, and they're because of danger of shooting civilian, Mr. Speaker. We think that when when we allow the, when we take the, when we take this definition out of the war crime and essentially allow these soldiers to engage and overtake village, and then and then ascertain who was actually innocent, who was actually not, we think that actually ends conflict better on two levels. One, we we we, sh we tell these terrorists, we tell these insurgents that villages are not your safe haven anymore. That means they they actually have less incentive to hide out in those villages because that puts greater levels of exposure, Mr. Speaker. Secondly, we also basically allow these uh, allow allow uh, conflicts to end sooner because essentially they don't they don't essentially these uh, essentially the soldiers are able to identify the insurgents and capture them and kill them whatever whatever that's necessary to end the conflict. Because, Mr. Speaker, with war, the longer it drags on, more people die, more people's lives are destroyed. We think that the side government that essentially ends the conflict as quick as quickly as possible that allows just means for these soldiers to protect themselves as well as end the conflict to save other people from being involved. We think that we think that opening government takes this debate today. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it's easier to win the, win the whole war if you simply bomb the town, if, we, if you simply nuke the city. What we would like to believe is that there, are, there needs to be a certain compromise in the war tactics based on certain principles. And we believe that even if that might compromise your military tactics to a certain extent, we believe that that principle is very absolute. And once you start to compromise that principle, we believe that there Needs, there, is, ha, there happens a very gray area in which it's prone to abuse, and we believe that that is why we should fundamentally oppose this motion. But before we move on, let's first clarify certain things because we are not saying that whether we are not saying like whether or not you can kill the civilians is whether or not you are going to be prosecuted as a war crime, whether you are going to be faced as a ramification of legal court once you start to kill the civilians. That's the kind of debate we're the, that we are engaging in, Mr. Speaker. So we have two issues in today's debate. Number one about moral justification. And secondly, how do we stall terrorist nation, uh, terrorist, terrorist ac activists from advancing in the first place? Yeah. I'm going to incorporate my rebuttals to the previous speaker as well as my argument as well. So first of all, let's talk about moral justification. But, but, but before moving on, we think that they talked about this collective duty problem, right? We have two rebuttals. Number one, Mr. Speaker, we believe that government faces a great conflict here, right? Because we asked in a POI, what are you going to do in the cases of hostage situation in which there is no collective duty or a collective responsibility existing in the first place? So they have to either choose that whether or not, whether or not their pure goal is to military, is about a military tactic or it's about a simple moral duty and a collective responsibility, right? And we think that they face a fundamental conflict. And if each, even if they choose like either side, we think that one of the principles has to be compromised to a greater extent. But secondly, we believe that this collective duty is not true. We believe that there is a clear distinction between a civilian simply harboring the insurgents and the insurgents like terrorist organizations in the first place. We believe that there was no intention for the civilians to actively kill and promote terrorist action in the first place. Whereas on the other hand, these terrorists were built for terrorist purposes. And we believe that when a terrorist organization comes in, puts a gun in their faces, and say that, oh, see, we are like families. We are the same racial group. You should help us out instead of those Western like faces and Western forces, that we believe that these civilians are likely to abide by these understanding because they also do not have much information about the war situations. No, sir. Secondly, is about international norm, because we believe that they also said, oh, this war crime is fine, because it's not like chemical weaponry. It's not like mining problems. Mr. Speaker, the problem with killing civilians and making an exception to that law in the first place is that you are pushing the boundaries and there are more likely to be abused, especially in a situation where it's a war crime. It's very hard to determine the evidence and it's likely to get really hazy throughout the process. We have three cases. Number one, we believe that you, have, you, have, you also have to defend things like indiscriminate killing, like machine gunning, because we believe that when the, all the people in the so, like all the people in the town is disguised as like a civilian and you don't really have an absolute, you don't really have a direct standard on which to judge whether or not that person is a civilian or a soldier, we believe that you are under your, your strategy, you have to kill these people in the first place. But secondly, they said that it is, a, it is like absolutely 
not, irre not relevant to the debate, if you're starting to t talk about like armed opposition insurgents against dictatorship government, right? We think that it's very hard to judge because we think that these civilians, we, um, because we think that once you start to make exceptions through this process, it's very hard to also judge whether or not that killing of civilians was a justified thing because we think that, as I told you, these war crimes are always very hard to judge and you are making an exception where, and you're making a new situation on which to judge whether or not it's an exception. It complicates the process of court in the first place. But third of all, Mr. Speaker, we believe that this also leads to a very prominent abuse. Things that happened in Vietnam War where people are simply raiding the civilian nations for food. Simply they're raiding and killing these civilians in the process because they also lack the food resources in the place there where they have no information geographically. Under this kind of characterization, we believe that you also have to defend these cases because there is after the war like happened and now you're put in a court of prosecution, it's very hard to judge whether or not it was a justified killing or it was simply a raiding. The, matter, the fact of the matter is that once you start conceding to the fact that civilians can be killed in a certain type of cases, we believe that it's also likely that these abuses will be justified, it's going to be condoned, and we believe that that is a problem. So we think that they simply lose the moral justification debate and also they're compromising the principles. We think that the government bench has to choose either one. Yes, sir. Closing. You say it's legitimate for people to take sides of people of the same face complexion. complexion. Yes, it's legitimate, but it's also legitimate to kill somebody who's now on the opposite side, on the enemy side. Okay, we think that that fundamentally compromises their collective responsibility argument because I'm, I'm further going to elaborate, but we think that that in itself, in and of itself, is like because they lack the information and we think that these civilians are forced in a situation and you're antagonizing these civilians even more. I'm going to further elaborate this in my second clash. So let's move on directly to my second clash about how do we stall these terrorist nations, right? So we think that our alternative is fundamentally cooperating with local groups like Kurdish groups, Persh Murgaw, we made it very clear from the first place. But Mr. Speaker, we consider and we are fine that these alternatives may be less militar militarily strategical than their side of the house. But what we are willing to defend is even if these moral, like these strategic, st these strategies may be less effective, we believe that we have certain principles that we have to, well. we have to hold and that is what we are defending in the first place. But let's move on because we think that they, what, they are, what their side is promoting is also exacerbating the situation and making it worse for worse for Western forces to win, even in this cases of terrorist nations, right? Why is that? Because we think it's more of a problem when these Western nations are forcing each town in a dichotomous situation where they have to either choose for Western forces or these terrorist organizations. Because now you're saying that once you even start to remotely harbor these insurgents and take action into their atrocities, you are now fundamentally considered not a civilian but a person that we can kill as well. So we think that you are forcing them in a dichotomous situation of either they have to choose A or B. Why is it more likely that these militant, why, why is it more likely that these civilian towns will choose for militant groups? Because we think that they're going to do a very, like, things that they're very good at, right? About this propaganda. That these Western forces now really don't care if you are a dead body or a living thing. They're going to say that we're likely to help you, we're likely to subsidize you because we're of the same race, because and they're going to exploit the situation where these civilians doesn't have a much of an information in terms of war. That is why we believe that there's going to be more towns supporting these militant nation, uh, these militant groups, more towns supporting terrorist organizations. We believe that that is fundamentally problematic because we all know that terrorist organization acts based on these geographical advantages, right? So that is why we're very proud to oppose. Thanks for The unique extension coming from the closing government exclusively is going to be threefold. Number one, we're going to talk about effectiveness. Why in the status quo, they pose inefficient war tactics. Number two, we're going to talk about why better accountability happens under our model. And number three, finally, we're going to 
tell you why in the status quo, more vilification on these innocent civilians happen more under their side, how that's going to be rectified under our model, right? But before that, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So what are the remaining questions in this debate? Madam Speaker and Mr. Speaker, we think that the reason why the opening half occurred in a vacuum is because even though OO gave us a very generic definition of a civilians, like people who are just doing with everyday lives and you know, inserted into horrible people, we think that the legal definition of why we actually punish war crimes in the status quo is because we presume that these civilians lack the capacity to actually attack the armed, yeah. armed like soldiers yeah. of ourselves. In other words, the, the justification of even constitution of these war crimes is that we pose civilians cannot attack us. Mr. Speaker, the whole of our case is going to tell you why such convenience ambiguity of these existing international law actually conveniently runs away from facing and rectifying the problems. Because we tell you, if you see, when, they, when international law in the status quo only addresses whether or not you know civilian has the capacity to shoot me or not, that's only dealing with the short-term consequence of causal casualty and harm on our army as a whole. We don't see them a commitment for that reason. But on the other hand, we tell you, if the act of harboring them, in other words, giving them food, giving them water, but ranging from letting them sleep, but we're also ranging to actually, you know, report, false reporting on ambushes and supporting ambush in the back side, seeing whether or not our American soldiers are coming or not, we think that this is exactly what constitutes a capacity to oppose yeah, harm yeah, yeah. in a militant sense. That's the reason why we need to additionally, you know, add on these things. We're going to further discuss this well, on deficiency of international law in our third extension. But secondly is this, let's deal with the question from opening opposition. Because opening opposition relies on this, you know, lack of capacity to choose either the definition. They say on one hand, you know, like these like innocent civilians, they didn't want to resort, they just, you know, forced into a situation where they needed to harbor. But on the other hand, they're saying, no, but they're going to actually hate people who come to rescue them. In other words, Mr. Speaker, when they say that they were forced and didn't have the capacity to actually fight back, but at the same time, do not somehow feel the deterrence that comes from actually, you know, being hide, we think that it's actually much better deterrence happening on our side. Why is this? Because if they have such a capacity on who is a better actor, the reason why under their calculus they somehow have more capacity or possibility of resorting to these militants is somehow because they pose imminent harm. If you don't, you know, hide me, then I'm going to kill you sort of situation if that were to even happen. Then we tell you, engaging with their worst case scenario, it is also our capacity on the soldiers who are there to fight the militants to say that, you know what, if the harms are there and that's your reason, we will also pose harm and that therefore that harm is what deters these people yeah. from actually hiding these things. That's the reason why we're going to further deter harms coming on, uh, upcoming on our soldiers. Second is this. Always doing this psychoanalysis saying that, you know what, like, oh, what if they didn't have any like information? There's such a lack of information. We think that you cannot ha hold that standard in a war where threat is there. In other words, when you, for instance, teenagers who actually resort to ISIS, do you think that they had a lack of like more information? All these Taliban, they're educated and coarse and brainwashed. But if you start coming up with these psychoanalysis saying that these people didn't have any calculus or these people have to resort, we don't think that there is necessary justification for you to say that that's a reason why we shouldn't attack them when you have to calculate out what harms are going to come on our behalf and how that's going to lengthen the war. And this is why uh, you can't sympathize. We think that that's the reason why this moves on to our first analysis on effectiveness, because that was not dealt with in the opening half of this debate. First of all, we tell you why the time frame is super important in this debate. We think that with, like, the reason why international law, uh, uh, the reason why international law exists is, uh, is to Actually, uh, uh, we think that wars are there, and we think that civilians die every day. But the problem is, how do we end the war? How do we efficiently uh, utilize our war tactics? We think that when it is proven by the motion that the capacity of the U.S. Army in and of itself is guaranteed that they can actually distinguish and demarcate who, what villages are actually more U.S. friendly, what villages are more supportive of the U.S. You know, like a truth compared to which are not. We think that it's much better when we have a clear demarcation as to when we can step in and when we can step out. That's the reason why when they start saying like, oh. Like we can't like bomb this one, we can't do this. We think that's a whole lie. Why is this? Because that doesn't happen in the status quo anyway. Civilians die every day, you know, people brush that off, but that doesn't actually lead to much coverage. That's going to be in my third extension. But secondly, on my uh, argument on accountability, why is this super important? On two levels. Basically, Mr. Speaker, number one, now what these US government is going to do is they, they're going to further strengthen these, you know, uh, uh, allocation of the troops or as assigning troops to uh, co corporations, PMCs like Blackwater, for instance, has been already happening, and we think that that's shifting accountability. Why is this horrible? Because we think that while state is accountable in the international court, at least in the status quo, we don't see states, for instance, like, uh, uh, sorry, corporations like PMCs, like Blackwater, actually holding accountability. You just hold massacre, and the, it's very easy and convenient for the USA. Oh, that's just the moral hazard of the corporation. Yeah. We've already seen that when Blackwater actually ran away from these crises in Iraq, mass killings. Don't lie, as if civilian killings don't actually happen. But 
uh, why better accountability happens on our side. We think that now we stop U.S. from cutting its tails and saying that you yeah, know what, yeah, yeah. our state level associate—it's not this like it's disassociated from these moral hazards of the corporations. We've seen already when like, Blackwater changes it's conveniently changed its name to Zay. We don't think that setting up these trials for these you know like corporations work anyway because you can simply put the you know problematic corporations in trial and say that you know what we've done our part and now we're going to just hire another contractor who happens to have another name. We don't think that that's inherently good in stopping or deterring more massacres or killings, right? But second, uh, more third extension, which is the most important extension in this debate, is this: Why further vilification happens under their model? Mr. Speaker, we think that the reason why vilification happens is as follows. In the status quo, let's be real, civilians die. And American people have killed these civilians, bombed them, droned them, whatever. That's the default setting. But how does better demarcation happen? And why did more vilification happen under their side? Because now it's easy for you to give the incentive to the soldiers to lie and conceal the act of it. Because you can simply say, uh, you, you, can, you have the incentive to bomb these villages because you need to win the war, because you need to save your soldiers, because you need to win this battle. But the problem is, when you cannot demarcate, and even though you can, we think that there's much more incentive for you to actually bomb villages and say, and, and the media coverage feeds into it because there is no codified standard in the international law. We think that the reason why codified standard is super important in international law is because it gives justification that actually stands. Now, when people bomb villages, depending on whether that village actually cooperated with the um, with the ISIS or combatants or whatever, we think that it's much easier for us to hold them accountability. Now, you can't simply brush off and say that, you know what, civilians died, uh, but they're not actually civilians, they were also cooperated. It's easier for us to actually demarcate who cooperated, who didn't cooperate, but since there is no standard in international law, and international law only gives you very minimum convenient options by saying, you know what, like a very minimum ones, we don't think that there's an additional codified like standard that we can utilize in terms of punishing these you know, troops or individuals from actually bombing the village or killing the civilians. Mr. Speaker, again, bombings, civilian killings happen anyway, but who actually holds better accountability? We think that it's closing government who provides the answer to. For all of those reasons, very proud to propose. You don't have batteries. She needs to get my order in order in order. Ladies and gentlemen, turn back the clocks about 100 years ago when imperialistic nations' powers to the UK or like the United States could go into other nations and like use tactics such as plundering or rape in certain cases and go without any subdue checks simply from the back because they said and said to the international arena that they it was necessary. It was necessary in order to support their security. It was necessary in many cases to support some kind of end goal to minimize harm. We think it's better in the current status quo when there's an internal international normative law is created on basis of unconsequentialist categorical basis that is what is the only thing that checks although it may not be a complete check we accept that the only thing that actually checks these international powers from becoming into like a state of anarchy where international super hegemonic parties dictate that is going to be our extension two point extensions first thing we're going to elaborate on what they just touched upon about the necessity of normative laws why they need to put exclusively why they need to be categorical and universal and why their thing of allowing something based on a consequential basis that often the powerful nations can dictate through media is going to have worse consequences at all. But secondly, we're going to have bring you practical impacts of why there are hands. It's going to create anarchy internationally where power and hegemonic powers can dictate everything and these lower grounds, maybe even insurgencies, cannot like have any sort of power and smaller states cannot have any say on like what justice is or like what like or influence the narrative of what, what is right. Okay, firstly, let's go on to the first thing. Well, firstly, before that extraneous rebuttal, they talk about accountability that like these American nations are like under the status 
cool. Sorry. They just simply do like do this to corporations that black water. Firstly, we think in many cases black water and these things are criticized and unjust in the first situation. But secondly, if they're not, it's mostly because the media don't frame it or make it a big issue. But it's because it is dictated by the United States and superpowers in the first place. But thirdly, the counterfactual in their case is that when it is allowed exclusively, it's not that America will simply do something else. It's that America can actually do it then justify based on the international arena and have no institutional checks whatsoever, maybe as petty as they can be. We don't see why that is a better situation. Iksun, come up and tell us why. Okay, let's go on to the major extent. Now, let's talk about the long, the thing is like 100, 200 years ago, there wasn't this normative sense of people when they said, when we see currently a person going out and killing a civilian, there is a massive rage of people and they say things are unjust. Turn the big clock back 200 years ago. There it was a necessary, it was a normative thing for people to go in and plunder, certain cases even rape, and it wasn't, there wasn't enough, there wasn't a lot, a lot of international stigmatization, neither was there any institutional checks in the United Nations. We think that that staying frame is worse off than the current staying frame. Current staying frame is what prevents like things, things to do. Why is this so? Because we think in the current status quo that law itself is not an incentive system. Now we accept the fact that in the status quo there are cases where these things exist because there is no there is no actual checks. But we think the major thing is that why international law exists is not an incentive system but a normative system. When you set something as something that is unjust categorically and we engage with the fact that you simply say that it is wrong to kill civilians because it's simply out of utilitarian calculus. The reason why there's international it's based upon what the UN says. There are universal human rights. You are a human being and if someone attacks you even like if you're based on your identity, or even if you're innocent, we think that's wrong. Like it may be regrettable in certain cases where you just like bomb people and end up dying, but it's wrong for you to attack an innocent person simply on the basis of struggle because you, as an individual, are commensurable. Now we think that may not be the actual situation in reality, but we say the narrative of the international arena saying that it is universal, categorical. It's what's better protects peace in the long term. Sir. And what they say, like, and like again, what this leads to is that once you don't allow them, once you open this up for this to say in certain cases it is right for you to kill a human individual human being, although he may prove no threat to you based on consequentialist basis that opens up debate for like in the international arena to say well why can't I go out and rape some wives of people because that will increase long term benefits why can't I go in and ethnically cleanse in certain situations because in the long term they can do so but the th interesting thing is in these situations the people who have the most say in these kind of discourses are going to be the more hegemonic nations the powerful nations who have the say the weaker nations even if they may be unjust, have no say in international arena, and we say that is bad. It undermines the whole justification of international. We say it's better to say, has except there may be more casualties, but we say it's better in the long term to say, like, there is universal laws that cannot be unjust based on a consequential basis. Sir. But more practical impacts. Why this actually creates, like, an international arena of, like, really, really bad stuff. Now, firstly, we say, uh, we accept the fact that international law is unenforceable. It is a state of anarchy. Certain people are going to try to, like, kill weeks Except, like the kill its citizens on certain cases. We don't think, first of all, we don't think we have to defend like accidental killings when you bomb places, when like, people people end up dying. What they have to defend actually is when you can exclusively go out and kill civilians, like, if it, like, if it is proven that it, like, if it is proven that they are, like, they are a substantial number in Sorry. these cases. We think the fact is the only check in the in moral international arena against these kind of superpowers from doing this is the fact that there's an international, there's an international normative law, and actually the people consider this a war crime when they First thing, they viscerally react to him when they see the United States killing a civilian. That's bad. Our country shouldn't do that. We think that's good. But firstly, again, proven itself is sub subjective. There's no situation in a war crime situation where there actually is proof in the real world. Why there's conditional evidence in least, and then often cases like international powers dictate the media. They can use rhetoric to say, like in certain there were a majority of people, they were trying to harm us. But in this situation, in this current status quo, when they're actually, you have to go to the international arena, there are checks because you have to prove the only because the only thing these weaker Sorry. nations have to prove in certain situations or insurgencies are like there are these people have killed us or these people are but now you when they have to prove like when they have to prove that there was a, it is incredibly easier for like these nations to dictate in the international arena to simply prove that say in the national arena that these people simply were a really big threat and they were a majority and we killed them but lastly uh, but 
more importantly, this isn't about simply macro level things. We think especially in guerrilla warfare, it's not about strategic people going out and saying like, no, these people are insurgents and kill them. We think guerrilla warfare and insurgency is stressful situation when there are individual units outside that go into towns that they don't know and they don't know which towns are which. We think in these cases when they're threatened and innocent, these individual units without their universal law that killing a citizen is bad are gonna tend to kill more people. This lengthens conflict, makes war more personal and transnational. And it's not the fact that IS recruits people by saying the United States is doing so. In the majority of cases in Vietnam, it's people that actually see their friends being massacred that say the United States is bad. We think that is what prolongs this conflict in most cases. But lastly, even if it does prolong this conflict and it does make things harder, we agree. We think it's gonna be harder to win wars and often in cases we think battles are gonna cause more casualties. We bite the bullet. We say exactly in Vietnam, that's the reason why but when it was easier for people to simply flame throw everyone and kill everyone for the United States to win the war. Why is the metric in the war of what helps the United States and these superpowers? Why is it like in China, and Putin can simply say, we want to kill all the Chechen rebels because in Chechenia, the insurgents are, are the majority. We think it is difficult for us to gauge whether or not what is the just insurgency, even in cases of terrorism. And often in cases in South Korea, there were people who said, uh, threw flame and tried to be insurgencies. In Japan, although there was just causing an imperialism, Japan simply said, these people threaten our security. We say it's better for these supporters to be unable to go in and easily win. That's what checks them. That's what brings them to the negotiation table. That's what actually gives the insurgencies all with their mind they may be just for them to actually have some kind of say and not these superpowers dictating and preparing their hegemonies which causes further harm in the current status quo. The metric is about international security of all nations, even these insurgencies, which they not simply brush off as unjust for the first place. We're very proud to post this here. May I start? Two themes that would properly frame this debate, war ethics and war effort on a principled and practical scale. Before that, let's take down CO. CO's essential extension is a slippery slope rhetoric about how, hey, if we start allowing something, everybody's gonna start raping, everybody's gonna justify mass killings and I don't know, like chemical weapons or whatever. Multiple responses. Number one, when they say that the rhetoric of how maybe sometimes it's normal to kill civilians will be normalized, we actually think that this is a positive thing. Because we think it's not the radicalization of war discourse, but rather the realisticization of war discourse. Because it's a known fact that civilians die in a war, and that is a normal thing to begin with. Under their paradigm, in which the death of a civilian in and of itself is a war crime and an abomination, that's when discourse is hushed and discourse is deliberately avoiding the realistic context. We'd rather live in a world where people of the ICJ, people of the court, are willing to accept that civilian death is normal, but also willing to accept that there are certain lines and certain levels of accountability which happens under CG. Secondly, we think that this is a comparative debate, and we think that the comparative other than CO is the stat status quo in which hiding and simply hush-hushing the whole incident and situation is much more possible under our paradigm. Because under the status quo, the thing is, soldiers do not have an incentive to report or accurately even have an investigation of anything to begin with. Because of the fact that any kind of civilian death is automatically a war crime, an abomination, we simply hide the whole discourse of the incident. Under our paradigm, why why is this better? Because under our world, soldiers have an active incentive to try to report and investigate because even in the status quo, the problem is soldiers are all stereotyped and mushed into this group of civilian killers, of Muslim killers, and they are heavily criticized and stereotyped. That's why under our paradigm, when we have a clear standard of what is a just killing and what is a unjust killing, then soldiers will be actively willing to report and prove themselves to the court why their killings was justified. We give that possibility of justice. But thirdly, when they say it's harder to wage conflict under their world and they're happy with that, we say the direct opposite. We think that that's the exact problem with the 21st century, that it's extremely difficult or almost impossible of any kind of humanitarian intervention to happen. We see terrorism, we see dysfunctional and warlord, warlord governments happening, we see civilians dying by the minute in like the Middle East. We think that intervention is necessary and some conflicts have to be fought. We'd rather live in a world where conflicts are easier to be fighted maybe, but at 
at least we have a clear line of justification of what is a just war and what is not. So let's move on to the first theme about war ethics. OO comes up with this, you know, very uh, general case about how the distinction between insurgent and civilian is vague. Mr. Speaker, yes, that is true, but also, uh, no, they say that there's a clear distinction between insurgent and civilian, but Mr. Speaker, there's also a clear distinction between a civilian and an insurgent harbor. We think that OG already did a sufficient job of telling you why, you know, when you harbor and actively help an insurgent, that is a direct contribution to the war threat, and that's why they're part of the enemy. No real response. But furthermore, when Elo comes up here and says, hey, but it's when there is no alternative, then it's all right to shoot civilians as a last resort. Number one, we think that their whole principle about how it's always bad to shoot civilians flies out the window. But secondly, that rhetoric that they use that there's, it is a last resort is the exact bestseller rhetoric that is used in the status quo already. Because there's no clear distinction or any kind of clear codified law of, of actual realistic killings, that's why American government is able to say, hey, it was a last resort, it was a necessary killing, hey, the PM did it, it wasn't our fault, and go away with that rhetoric that they talk about. That's why no accountability happens. But furthermore, Mac already gave you the clear actual definition of what the principle of war crime is. It is, we think that it's not a war crime if you kill somebody that is a potential threat to you. The very reason rape or like innocent killings are, is bad, because it's not a threat to you. We've told you multiple times why, you know, contributing to that war crime and not uh, contributing to ambushes and not knowing where, if I go to his house, somebody will come out from the basement and kill me is already a potential threat to those soldiers' efforts, and that's what gives justification for killings. But furthermore, when O talks about how, hey, insurgents have legitimate concerns, insurgents weren't educated, so that's why they become, you know, harbors of insurgents. Mr. Speaker, Mac already told you if that's the case, we shouldn't ki kill Taliban's and ISIS people because they were brainwashed off of a back of lack of information. Psychoanalysis has no place in a war debate, especially when because it doesn't change the fact that those people are still a threat to us. The metric should not be the psychological background of these people. The metric should be the practical effect upon our war effort and whether he has the potential to show me war ethics fall on TG. Secondly, let's talk about the war effort itself and whether we fight more efficient wars and whether we fight more accountable wars. Number one on efficiency. OO says, hey, more people are going to join the insurgents because they're scared. No, more people will snitch because they're scared. That's what happens. If people are scared, that they're, they're going to be mushed into this group of enemies, then obviously they will be actively reporting upon other people, reporting the people in their basement, and snitching upon those enemies. We think that more, less people will be part of the enemies under our paradigm. Furthermore, we told you about the importance of the time frame, importance of a window of opportunity, and OG already told you why, when you don't go into that, it, it lengthens the warfare and kills more civilians. That harm calculus already falls on us. But furthermore, we think that the fundamental problem that Mac analyzed to you is that the legal condition of the status quo of what a war crime is, is obsolete and unrealistic. Because the thing is, the war crime constitution says right now, anybody who does not actively identify as a ISIS is automatically innocent, and if you shoot them, it's a war crime. You cannot shoot any civilians at all, but the realistic context is, they do. Civilian bombings happen by the weak, and civilians die in every sort of conflict anyway. We'd rather live in a world where we realistically recognize and acknowledge the reality but also have accountability. We gave you why the status quo avoids accountability because of two reasons. Number one, because now if the US soldiers shoot the uh, civilians or like the harbors, they become war criminals. That's why they use PMCs so that even if the PMCs get caught shooting civilians, they can simply cut the tail off and get another, uh, re uh, recruit another comp corporation and completely move on with the accountability. No responsibility happens in the status quo. But secondly, they rely on the rhetoric of mushing and stereotyping the whole people of the enemy nation together and saying that they're all enemies and vilifying them through the media, especially in the Trump age that we live in right now. Just as in the Iraqi invasion when the Bush regime completely vilified and stereotyped the entire Islam nation as terrorists, we think that that sort of thing is much more prone to happen in a status quo where it is impossible to have a justified killing or justified operation of efficiency. They're going to rely on these media vilification. But furthermore, we told you in the intro, why soldiers do not want to be mushed and stereotyped together as Muslim killers or civilian killers. That's why they have an incentive to actively try to demarcate the towns and tell why my killing was justified so more investigations and accountability happen under CG. Because we believe in a real realistic context and also a realistic warfare discourse, that's why CG takes first. <laughs> Yes. 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 Yes.
isn't about whether we make discourse more realistic. It's whether we give superpowers the institutional justifications to do what they're already doing. Here, here. Horrific acts of killing civilians whenever necessary to further their own ends, right? So first of all, like, let's make it very clear, right? They come up and say, when we make discourse clear to everyone, it's going to be a good result. People are going to distinguish between what is just, what is unjust, right? First of all, already, even with institutional checks, superpowers come up and say, well, we did the right thing anyway, right? So what they have to defend is probabilistically, their world is more likely to, to, to create discourse that is genuine, right? We think that when superpowers have all of the power over dominant media narratives and what is just and right, we think that the problem is no, none of the small countries or the small insurgents have a say, right? We're the only team in this debate to provide that metric to you, right? OG came up and told you that we need to reduce civilian pain. That's the only analysis that they gave. They failed to see the long-run consequences. They may win the battle, but they, they lose the war, right? OO came up and said that, okay, pushing boundaries of international order, right, is bad, right? And then CG come up, right? And we're going to do rebuttals for this one, right? So first, they come up and talk about effectiveness, right? This is the same line that comes out of opening government, right? We say that even if the distinction of threat versus no threat stands, right, as we told you, these dominant narratives are inherently set by hegemonic powers, right? So what this means is that you can literally say the United States can bomb civilians, shoot civilians intentionally and tell the media, well, it was justified, it's not a war crime. So, because it was for the greater good. When we make public discourse around this area, around war crimes, consequentialist in nature, mm -hmm. as Shinte told you, we uniquely tell you that that leads to people thinking it's okay to kill these civilians, war crimes increase, right? And secondly, so, even if that's true, right, they never responded to OO's contention that people are Oh, they lose the propaganda war. Right? They say like vilification happens because the United States government hides these things, right? When the US government is coming out and killing people, what do you think people are gonna be more mad about, right? Them intentionally killing civilians or them intentionally hiding the fact that they killed civilians, Sorry. right? We say that when there are more deaths on the ground because of these bullshit consequentialist arguments, we say that people are going to be more pissed, right? ISIS wins out. Junte is the only person in this room to provide so, that analysis, right? So why do we carry this debate home, right? Because we care about accountability, right? So we're the only team that came out and explained to you what the international order is really about, right? So it has all the characteristics of the law, like, i.e. it is a normative system, but it has limited enforceability, right? That's why, for example, when the United States goes to Iraq and kills civilians, the President of the United States doesn't go to the ICJ, whereas Gaddafi has to, right? So, Secondly, right, we think that superpowers use it to check and balance each other as well, right? The reason why this is true, as Shunte told you, right, is because optics or the visual visceral stimulus that people get in these countries matter, right? So when the United States goes and bombs other countries, right, it doesn't really matter what the international organizations, like, uh, what, other, what other countries say, they have to say, well, through these international organizations, we can justify this on the grounds that these aren't war crimes, so, right? So because it's a normative system, we're incentivized, so this is, this is a normative system based on perceptions, right? This is something we need to know. This is, only, this is the thing that came out only from um, our side, right? So, why are war crimes, why do war crimes, like this is another unique contribution coming out from our side, right? Why do war crime have to be, um, why, why do war crimes have to be on categorical imperative narratives, right? They say consequentialism is good. The reason why this is so is because if we live in a perfect world where Everyone gets perfect information, maybe that would be true. But in reality, 
international law loses meaning when categorical forms of these discourses disappear. Why? Because superpowers are the ones that mold the international order and set dominant narratives. So, so when, so when, they, so, so, so when, so when the United States kills civilians, right? And they can literally tell the public this was justified and it's justified through institutions like the UN, right? We don't think it's okay because the United States has asymmetric power over all other countries. Sir? Same for China, same for Russia. Why would you disagree? Close it. You say consequentially, superpower slaughter anyway and it never can be stopped. Is it institutionally recognizing those slaughters but also drawing lines for investigation to increase at least better marginally? Sir. When these international organizations are literally stacked with Americans, Russians, Chinese, British, French people, why would they even do that, right? These representatives come from these superpowers. The whole order is rigged in favor of these superpowers, right? So this is uniquely inter uh, based on interventions, right? We told you about optics, right? Why optics matter, right? When people don't care about civilian deaths and insofar as they produce good consequences, they fall into a media narrative or like public narrative of okay, it's okay to kill, right? This increases war, it, this increases unjustified forms of war as Chinte uniquely pointed out, right? We don't think there's an absolute truth in war, we think that these things are based on narratives set by international organizations and hegemonic powers. International order is the nature in which, uh, is, 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 is the frame in which this debate should have happened, and we're the only team that engaged with the nature of international organizations. So at the end of the day, the comparative is this. The government creates narratives that are consequentialist in nature, and we create narratives based on duty. We say that accountability comes on our side because we recognize that narratives are rigged for, uh, in favor of superpowers and because we recognize that they can manipulate these narratives to kill civilians. We're very proud to oppose.